a mathematician, and I still have some friends that keep being mathematicians. And uh, one of these friends always is interested in asking me uh, what uh, is special about small talk and if small talk can do this or can do that, etc. I, of course, always said to him, yes, we can do everything. So one day, the guy came and said, okay, given that small talk is so powerful and you are so confident about it, uh, I have a problem because I'm doing some research in homological algebra and uh, the problem is that uh, I need your assistance because the things is getting increasingly complicated and I cannot check some things and I think I have uh, made a mistake in the paper uh, so if we can run some examples in the computer uh, that will help me to find a mistake and keep going. So I said, oh, so it sounds like fun and a good idea. So the guy came with this paper. It's 40 pages long. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, is it it's an unusual, an unusual kind of paper for this part of mathematics, um, monological algebra, because mathematics is like the art of never calculating anything. Okay, <laughs> they uh, mathematicians find uh, relationships between things <laughs> that never go deep enough to produce any numerical result or those sort of things. In this case, what this paper is about is about a very abstract topic with many <coughs> a theory, a well-known theory that uh, exposes many, many relationships between objects that are composed in a, a, a very deep nesting sequence. And this paper is about actually calculating something. It's like the abstract version of finding an algorithm that uh, calculates things from this super abstract theory. Okay? Uh, so, when I saw this uh, uh, frightening paper, I said, okay, let's start with something, right? So, uh, show me, uh, excuse me, I will start this. So, the guy started uh, showing me some structures, okay? The structures were too complicated. So I said, okay, show me the parts that made up this structure. So we went through a less complicated, but still impossible to understand type of, uh, of options. <laughs> then we went back to a simple part, the simple part, until we arrived to the integers. And I said, okay, I can do integers. <laughs> okay, but this is not this is a joke, but also is the truth. In mathematics, everything starts from here. You can you could say it's a good starting point for anything. So we already have integers, so uh, we can start from here. So the next step was to build polynomials. Okay, a polynomial is a, a, an expression, a formal expression like this, this one. Uh, so. Uh, we, uh, it's uh, natural for, for a small docker to, to model these variables, okay? So you model polynomials, the coefficients are integers. In this case, it was a good, a good uh, assumption. 
Now, when you start building some interesting mathematical object like a polynomial, there are like two pathways. You, you have to make a decision. Is your polynomial just a data, data structure, like the array of coefficients, or is something else? Is an object that you want to model as much as possible? In this case, I knew that polynomials were just the first step. So I wanted first class object for that. But this is, has like two consequences. First, it's not just the polynomial is a first class option. Also, the indeterminate x must be a first class option. And the, all the, the set, techni technically the ring of polynomials, the set of all polynomials, has also to be an option. And uh, so I, of course, took the second decision um, of modeling all of this, and this has uh, rather a new, this is rather unusual because in small talk we have the class integer, but we don't have the integers, the set of all integers. We have a fraction, but we don't have the rationals, like an option. We have the elements, okay? So usually we model the elements, but not the mathematical structures that they form. But in this case, because of the need of composing, and composing again uh, further, more structures, you have to do this kind of, of things. Uh, so, okay, uh, so I have the integers, I have my polynomials, and it, this is about composition, so you can add a second indeterminate, y in this case. So you have polynomials with two variables, right? And uh, if, if you have polynomials with two variables, x and y, usually one thinks of x y times y equals y times x, okay? But this is commutative algebra. And this paper is about non-commutative algebra. <laughs> okay. So, I try to be positive and say, well, this is actually a constraint because I am imposing this uh, equation, okay? So, okay, let's get rid of the constraint and let's go to the non-commutative action. So, in this case, we have no the ring of polynomials in two variables, the usual one, but something that is similar uh, except that there is, this is not commuted. So, but, so, to differentiate it, this in the notation, here I, I'm using square brackets and here I'm using curly braces, okay? And here is an example. For, for instance, this is one of these polynomials. x, y, minus i, uh, y, dx, etc. So this is not zero. The, the first two uh, don't cancel. And of course, the paper is uh, a research paper. It's uh, pure mathematics, pretty abstract. So two variables is <laughs> not interesting enough. So it's n variables, okay? And with no no community, okay? So it's a generalization of that, okay? So so uh, along this this theme. I, uh, of course, been working with this guy on the weekends because I have my real work. So we spent like a year every weekend, and every every weekend we we composed what we had with the next level of complexity. Okay, and this is very interesting because uh, no matter how afraid I was, after thinking in the problem for an hour or half an hour or something like that, I always could figure out how to keep going without uh, adding too much complexity so I couldn't actually manage that. And this is really beautiful and, and really powerful. You can keep going at the same pace of a super abstract mathematical paper or research project. So, okay, do you remember 
uh, you have uh, any function and, and you uh, think of the tangent line, like the derivative, right? Well, if you uh, do this in more than uh, in, 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 in two dimensions, instead of a curve, you have a surface, let's say. So the tangent is now not a line, but a plane in orange here, okay? And if you go in more and more dimensions, well, you can imagine what happens. <laughs> the, the plane, the hyper hyperplane, etc. So, but the nice thing here is that you are going from a totally wild uh, function to something that has nice algebraic properties because the line, the plane, the hyperplane, all of these are, are vector spaces. So it's algebra. So you are going from uh, some uh, domain that has to do with uh, derivatives and all of that, and you can uh, translate all that is happening there into algebra or geometry, linear geometry, linear algebra. Okay, and here is where things start to be interesting because if you have a space that represents um, uh, tangent spaces or planes hyperplanes, then you can, uh, and, and when you translate this to an algebraic language, uh, funny uh, objects start to appear, like differential forms, okay? And of course, you don't have to, to understand what a differential form is, but these are elements that translate a geomet uh, differential geometry object into algebra. So you can use uh, another theory to deal with these guys. So this is differential geometry can be translated to differential <coughs> algebra. But the problem was that we were in the non-commutative uh, world. So we have non-commutative differential algebra, uh, which produces non-commutative geometry, which nobody, even the mathematicians, can imagine. But they still study that. Okay, so above you go from geometry to algebra. Below you go from algebra to the geometry of a space that nobody can measure. So this is how it looks in small talk. You, you, you can build this in small talk. I will show you later. This is uh, the set of all differential forms. A differential form is like a formal expression where V stands for the um, differential operator and the PI are polynomials. The polynomials I, I showed you before, several variables, non commutative polynomials. Okay? So you can build this and uh, the differential operator is, if you remember, the derivative of the product is the derivative of the first times the second, etc. So this has, this is a, an algebraic property, okay? So this is, there are some similarities with the calculus uh, lessons. And of course, this is not, you, they compose this a little bit more and introduce tensors. Tensors are like uh, um, the generalization of products. So a tensor looks like this thing, this one. The red thing, I didn't have this letter in, in my font, so I had to put an O and an X here. But mathematicians did have this because they use Latin, etc. So, you can have tensors and there are several frameworks and I'm not trying to, to, to show this to you to follow the logic, just to uh, have an idea of the steps of composition. So you have the integers, you have the, the polynomials, the, then you have the differential forms, then you combine differential forms into uh, tensors, okay? Uh, and then you you have something called 
uh, direct sums, uh, sums which is similar to arrays of these things. So here is one that is almost trivial because the first component is zero, and the other one is a differential form. So you keep uh, composing spaces and, and elements, and the way that mathematicians use to understand all of this is not by thinking in, in, in these kind of elements. They don't think in, in, in terms of elements or polynomials or differential forms or, or, or in terms of products. They think in terms of diagrams. And what is a diagram? Well, a diagram is something like this. Uh, the nodes in the diagram are these spaces, like differential forms or, or things like that. And the arrows are, you can think of them as functions. And if you can go from a node to another node, and you uh, have one function and the other function, uh, you compose the functions. And you have several ways to go from one node to another node. For instance, you can do this and this, or you can do that and that. Okay? Uh, so the idea is that uh, these things should be equal. There are other arrows, etc., etc., and this turns to be infinite, of course. Uh, so mathematicians uh, think, think in terms of diagrams. If diagrams are made of objects and arrows, okay? The, the objects are the nodes, which are algebraic structures. And the arrows, you can think of them as functions, algebraic functions. Well, not quite, because in their desire to compose all the time, they sometimes think of an infinite row as an object. Okay, so let's represent here this object. Collapses to one object. It doesn't collapse, it's, it's, it's one object in mind. So here we have another object, here. <coughs> and all these arrows, they think of all the family of arrows as just one arrow. So they start from an infinite diagram, then probably they rethink the diagram using this technique, and they uh, produce a <coughs> simpler but very nested new diagram, and then they build new diagrams like this one, where the nodes are these infinite sequences. And of course, these things are not, cannot be drawn in a plane because they tend to be three-dimensional. So you can imagine, <coughs> can you? Um, a diagram here, a diagram there, a diagram there, and arrows going in every direction. And the nodes are probably diagrams themselves. But incredible, all of this can be model in small talk in a very natural way. I won't say it's easy, but it's possible and it's natural. Okay? So I will give you an idea on the details because this paper was about finding a mistake because the, these guys, these mathematicians, knew that they could calculate something. But it was so complicated that at some point they couldn't prove a theorem and they suspected that there was a mistake before a book in the paper. But it was impossible to check. Impossible to check. So to, have you, to, to give you an idea of the difficulties of trying to run some examples by hand, uh, this is one of the pages of the paper. Anyone, look at this. This is the exponent of minus one. So to compute the sign, Okay? You have to do this. And look at this exponent. Can be... And, and look at this one. <laughs> this is just an exponent of a sign of one of these crazy double sums. 
and in the enumeration of these sequences of things is not trivial, it's not for I from 1 to L. <laughs> there is some funny indexes, sub, uh, uh, sub index uh, that you have to enumerate in order to collect all the things. And things. So it's impossible by hand, but it's possible in small talk. It's incredible, it's possible. And so the idea was I had to model everything just to build some tests. Okay? So I model something, I model something, run some tests. All the tests passed. Okay, the mistake is not here. Let's compose a little bit more and, and let's uh, model more. Let's run the test. Sometimes the test didn't pass because of uh, a mistake of my part, of my part. Okay? Not because of the paper. So we get used to this like of uh, repetitive pattern of <laughs> thinking how to model this. Oh no, more, more compositions, more complexity. Okay, do do do. Then running the test. There's a mistake. My mistake. Ah, uh, it's here. I fixed the mistake. The paper was still right. Until one day, one of the tests didn't pass. Okay, and so we got convinced that this time the mistake was in the paper. And by looking at the result of, 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 the, of the unit test, uh, we could, this guy, could, the mathematician, could actually say, yes, I understand, this is a mistake. And Smolta was uh, telling him the actual formula, the actual thing. It was very, very interesting because the solution is, it didn't all, only uh, find the mistake but also show the solution. Of course, in, in a mathematical paper, you have to uh, write a formal proof. So, Smalltalk wasn't giving him the proof, but by giving him uh, the right expression, then it was easier for him to write the proof. So, very excited, this was about page, I don't know, 30 or something like that, out of 40. So it was very exciting. <coughs> and so the guy went away and said, thank you, uh, I will come back once I have the proof and we will finish the, 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 the check of all the paper. And he came back six years later. <laughs> <laughs> this year. <laughs> so all my excitement has to be had to be rebuilt in my mind. <laughs> I had to love again to to, uh, to to immerse myself again in the code, in the paper, in the routine of this uh, uh, interesting weekends, etc. So all this year I've been working with this guy. And I said, okay, the first day I said, okay, okay, I have everything, let's start. Where was uh, the, the, the point where we left? We remember the mistake. I said, yes, I did you took note of that? Of course, I, I took note of that, but I lost the annotation. I don't know. But don't worry, he said, let's start over, all over again. <laughs> So it was like a continuous discussion. <laughs> he wanted to start from the beginning. I didn't want that. <laughs> uh, we review everything. Uh, eventually, we hit again the place where uh, the, the paper was wrong. And uh, uh, then we kept going. And we found more, more of this wrong. Uh, part of, uh, of uh, more mistakes in the paper, and it was very interesting because at some point, at that point, I was like uh, very confident in myself. So, if the test didn't run, I was playing with uh, he was with pencil and paper trying to prove. And I said, "What if you change uh, this sign over here? Because if with this change, the test starts." <laughs> 
oh, yes, it worked. So he went and wrote the proof, etc. So it was a very collaborative team in, in that we were all the time using Smalltalk or uh, his brain to, to do all, all the things. And um, so I don't know if I'm okay with the time. I wanted to, to show you something else. Do I have some few more minutes? Hmm? Okay, excellent. So, so in, during this time, this year, uh, and I of course uh, work in, in a company that makes a product, etc., etc. And we we are one of the things we do a lot is uh, statistical computations or probability computations. And um, when when you are trying to do uh, probability computations. Uh, it's very often frequent that you, you have many calculations, you have to calculate many things, like for instance, you have a huge sample of numbers and you want to calculate the average, okay? Uh, the mean value, the average, or sometimes you want to be more, a little bit more sophisticated and you want to calculate the variance or the standard deviation, or things of that kind. And given that the samples tend to be very large, you would like to do this in parallel, okay, to, to save time. And uh, so, for instance, if you have some numbers here, a sample of numbers, and you want to compute the mean value, you sum them all and then divide by the number of elements, right? This is the average. And this is the kind of uh, calculation you have to do for the variance, okay? And this is for the skewness and this is for the kurtosis. This is a little bit more technical, but this very well known and normal statistical estimation, estimators stuff. Um, so the problem is how to compute these quantities in parallel, because all of them depend on the average, and the average is the average of the entire sample. So it is not trivial to compute, uh, for instance, M3 for one part of the sample, then M3 for the other part of the sample, and then from those uh, results compute the final entry. It's not trivial. But if you Google a little bit, there is a theoretical solution that, and here is the paper, okay? I Googled that, I found a paper that explains how to compute all of this in part. So, I said, okay, but this paper is not that simple. And uh, I can translate the formula and write the small talk, the equivalent small talk of the formula, but I, I don't believe the formula. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I need to check this. Um, besides, if you look here, for instance, this sum goes from k equal, equals to 1 to b minus 2. But here you have this, uh, this uh, binomial number. And if you know very elementary uh, mathematics, you know that this doesn't make sense because the number above has to be larger than the number below. So there is still uh, at least one small mistake in the paper. Remember, mathematicians uh, prove the theorems, but they never check anything. They don't test things. <laughs> so, what I did, well, what I did was I used these ideas of using uh, polynomials to generate uh, the examples. So, I, I, I used polynomials in several variables, and these ones with the square brackets, because this is commutative, the commutative case. And um, let me see if I can show you an example. So for instance, here, I have to check the formula that is in the paper. So if you run the formula here, you will end up with this, this very nice polynomial. Okay? impossible for a human being to see whether 
a polynomial of this size equals other polynomial that according to the paper should be the same as this one. This is impossible. And this is just an example. By the way, a polynomial here, what you see here is not just a display. I, uh, you can see the monomials, the mon this is, these are options, right? So for instance, this is a monomial that has a coefficient. I love fraction. 